In this video, we're looking at the first part of 2 Timothy chapter 3, the sermon I preached from this section I called Misplaced Love. It's really important to remember that what Paul writes here follows on very tightly to what we saw at the end of chapter 3, where he says, but mark this, it's referring to what he just spoke about at the end of chapter 2. And in that section at the end of chapter 2, we saw this contrast between uh, false teachers, the devil's servants, and true teachers, the Lord's servants. And so we need to read this in the context of what we saw at the end of chapter 2. And so the primary focus of this whole section is on leaders in the church. I really do encourage you just to take some time to read through this passage a few times yourself, just to familiarize yourself with the text. And also take some time to pray and ask God to help you to understand his word of truth. If you are new to this channel, then I encourage you to subscribe, like this video, share it with others who you think might find this helpful. And as always, I'm just going to highlight some of what I've seen in the text. Now, a big thing that we've seen in the whole of 2 Timothy so far is Paul's focus on the truth. And what we saw in the previous section was that true teachers correctly handle God's word of truth, where the false teachers have departed from the truth. And here we see the focus on the false teachers in this section as those who, have, who stand opposed to the truth. And this section seems to pivot around this imperative that we're given in this section. It's the only command in, in these few verses. And the imperative here have nothing to do with such people. So an imperative is a verb that is a command. And Paul is commanding Timothy to have nothing to do with those who have departed from the truth. And here in this section, that departure from the truth is seen in misplaced love. And Paul is urging Timothy to avoid leaders who are shaped by a misplaced love rather than being shaped by God's love because their impact on God's church is devastating. Now, although there's a whole long list here, we do see this repetition of the different things that they love or don't love. And we'll focus in to see how these misplaced loves are devastating to God's church, if those things are the things that are shaping the leaders in God's church. But before we dig into those, just a couple of comments just on this first verse. So, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. And what exactly are the last days? That's very important for us to think through. They aren't some days that we're waiting for sometime in the future. The last days are the days that we are living in now, the church age. The last days began when Jesus rose from the dead, and the last days will end when Jesus returns in glory to make all things new. We are living in the last days. And when he says there will be terrible times in these days, he's not talking about society in general, although that's true. There will be terrible times in the world in general in these last days. But flowing out from what we saw in chapter 2, where, with this picture of the devil's servants out to do the devil's will, when the devil's servants are active in God's church, that'll mean terrible times in this church age uh, for all those who are in uh, God's church. Now this list starts by saying people will be lovers of themselves. But by the time we get to the end of the, verse, the, the section at least, where we see they uh, aren't lovers of God, they have a form of godliness but deny its power, it's clearly not just talking about people in the world in general. It's talking about people who are seeking to lead God's church, flowing straight out of chapter 2. They seem to have an appearance of being genuine, but they're denying the power that we've seen already at work in chapter 1, verse 8, where these false teachers aren't working with God's power. They're doing things in their own strength. Now, the list starts with this, they will be lovers of themselves. And Paul starts there in many ways because that is the biggest danger. If a leader in the church is a lover of himself, 
then all these other things flow out of that self-love, uh, what our world commonly calls narcissism. To have a narcissistic leader in the church is terrible. Now, love is of money, so this is greed. Boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. What's important to see in all of these things is if they correctly handled God's word of truth, which we're called to do in chapter 2, then they would see, they would know that in God's word of truth, all of these things are spoken against for those who belong to God's family. But because they have departed from the truth, the truth isn't shaping them, and actually they have placed their love on other things and being shaped by this misplaced love, and it's detrimental to both them and the churches they're leading. Uh, this word slanderous uh, is uh, literally devilish. So we saw at the end of chapter 2, they've been taken captive by the devil to do his will, and it's being seen in their um, devilish behavior within the church. Uh, they are treacherous, uh, so ready to betray their friends. Lovers of pleasure, so hedonists. They're just out to have a good life now. Now, when a leader who is a lover of themselves is leading the church, then all the preaching and programs become focused on me rather than being focused on the love of God that we see at the end. They, they aren't lovers of God, rather they are lovers of themselves. It's all about me. And here in verse 6, we see they're the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control. That's what they want. That's an important verb in this section. Uh, they, they want the control because actually it's all about them rather than God, and they want people under their control rather than being under uh, God's power. And you see here that, yes, they are teaching because these women under their control are always learning, but they're never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, we saw that God our Savior wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants people to come to a knowledge of the truth. But these false teachers are teaching false truths. And because they are lovers of themselves, they don't want people to come to a knowledge of the truth about God who wants them to be saved. Rather, they want to gain control over them, keep them captive to themselves, and rather not let them be freed by the truth about Jesus, which is the truth that will set them free. And Paul then says that these false teachers are just like Yanis and Yambres, who opposed Moses. Now, those names aren't uh, found in uh, God's word specifically, but in the tradition of that day, Yanis and Yambres were the names given to Pharaoh's magicians, who we see in Exodus chapter 7, who, when... Aaron's staff became a snake, these magicians also were able to turn their staffs into snakes and they used their magic arts to oppose the truth that Moses and Aaron were bringing to say that God wanted to set his people free. But these false teachers, just like Janus and Jambres, they didn't want people to be free. But just as we see in that story, we see here, but they will not get very far for, as in the case of those men so the, those men are the Yanis and Jambres. Their folly will be clear to everyone. In that story, we see uh, Aaron's staff that turned into a snake goes and gobbles up their snakes. But the striking thing that Paul is showing here is that by having a misplaced love, they are actually opposing the truth, which is a truth that should be pointing us to be lovers of God rather than lovers of anything else. But these teachers oppose the truth. And the language that Paul uses is very strong. They are men of depraved minds uh, or corrupt minds. Corrupt minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected or disqualified. And so that's why Paul said in verse 5, 
have nothing to do with such people. Now, this is the big command, the only command in these verses. If they, if they don't love God rightly, then have nothing to do with them. Because leaders who are shaped by a misplaced love will be devastating on God's church. And tragically, we see leaders who are shaped by themselves, love of themselves uh, in the world around us, and their ministry becomes me-focused. And tragically, we also see uh, many leaders who are driven by the love of money. The health, wealth, and prosperity gospel is a key example of this, uh, where we see the love of money being the thing, it's greed that drives those churches. And we also see churches that are driven by the love of pleasure. So it's just about having the good life now. And actually, uh, these churches then focus on minimizing sin and saying, actually, no, just enjoy uh, life your way rather than enjoying it God's way. And I think much of the sexual sin and lack of sexual ethics within the church today is just one example of churches that are shaped by a love of pleasure because we don't trust that God's design for sex is the best design. And so rather we make up our own rules. And leaders who are shaped by this have a devastating impact on God's church. So Paul says, have nothing to do with leaders like this. And he does encourage right at the end where he just says, their folly will be clear to everyone. A truth will win in the end. And these are such important verses for us in our world today. Uh, we want to make sure that we are being led as churches by leaders who are correctly handling God's word of truth, which we saw in chapter 2, rather than leaders who have departed from the truth. Because leaders who have departed from the truth will never lead people to a knowledge of the truth because actually they're opposed to the truth. They will lead people to be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure. And the result is all of these things becoming the characteristics of those under the leadership of, of leaders who aren't lovers of God. If they aren't lovers of God, the result is seen in a life that is shaped by misplaced love and it's increasing ungodliness, which we saw in uh, the previous section as well. Uh, it seems to be a form of godliness, but it's actually just ungodliness because they're denying God's power and rather are living in their own strength for their own good rather than living for the glory of God. And so this section is so important for us to think through. We need to make sure that we avoid leaders who are shaped by misplaced love. We need leaders who are shaped by God's love because only leaders who are shaped by God's love will bring great glory to God and will have the right impact on the world around us, an impact that will be uh, for God's glory alone. So we need to pray for leaders who will be lovers of God. And why is our God worth loving? Uh, because as Paul has been highlighting the whole time, our God is a God of love, a God who loves us so much that he sent Christ Jesus into the world to save sinners, which was what Paul said in his first letter to Timothy. And we need to remember this truth, not that we try and figure out how to love ourselves more or to love money more, to love pleasure more, but rather to remember that you are loved. God loves you so much that he sent Jesus into the world to save a sinner like you. And in response to his great love for us, we need to be lovers of God and have leaders who are lovers of God who will then shape their church all around a deep love for the God who came, who sent Jesus into the world to save sinners like us. So pray for your church, pray for the churches in our generation and in the generations to come that we will be churches shaped by a deep love for God in response to his incredible love for us, seen most gloriously in King Jesus. Well, God bless as you dig in further.